It's commonly thought that there were six different cradles of civilization around the world. That is to say, six different places where the roots of what we consider to be modern civilization took hold. Typically, these are places where agriculture was developed, and as a result of agriculture and the ability then to feed a greater number of people and to develop specialization, people began to settle and they began to organize and they began to create complex social structures and began to create urban centers, cities and towns and townships. This usually led to the development of different types of artwork and war and new types of religion and sophisticated writing systems and numerical systems, the evolution of languages. So this is not where humanity began. That is still commonly believed to be something that took place in Africa and then a chunk of the human race decided to leave and migrated outward to go populate the planet. And then over a period of time, as they arrived in these different areas, eventually their wandering and hunting and gathering lifestyles gave way to agriculture and eventually the roots of civilization. And these six different areas are Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Indus River Valley, which is India and the surrounding area, China, the Central Andes in South America, and Mesoamerica, which is like Mexico, Central America, and potentially even the top part of South America, depending on how you measure this. And in that last area, Mesoamerica, there were a bunch of different cultures that emerged over the years, but probably the most well-known of these cultures and the one that has the biggest resonance and has had the biggest impact that's still around today was the Maya civilization. And the Maya, they were pretty expansive. Their territory included southeastern Mexico and northern Central America including parts of the modern-day countries of Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador. Based on the radiocarbon dating that we've done on some artifacts from the area, it's believed that the Maya forefathers began settling and planting in the area as early as 2600 BC. By a few thousand years later, about 230 to 900 BC, it's estimated, they had become a largely urban culture. And though they still had smaller villages and smaller towns, a great deal of their population lived in cities. And many of their cities were populated with 50 to 120,000 people and had very complex politics. That's huge for this period of time, by the way. Uh, even a lot of European cities that were considered to be quite vast didn't have these numbers when it came to population. And as a result of these cities, they began to build increasingly impressive feats of architecture and artwork. And part of the reason that we know so much about the Maya compared to other cultures in the region at this time is that they adhered to a time measurement system called the long count calendar, which they're not unique for this. A lot of other cultures in the region had something similar, but the Maya had this system which essentially measures time in periods from the supposed date when humanity, the human world, was created. And that date, if measured in the Gregorian calendar, is August 11th, 3114 BC. And so chiseled into a lot of their artwork and a lot of their great statues and obelisks and things of that nature, we have a date from that date that humanity was supposedly created. And so we're able to fairly accurately identify when these different things were built, which really helped us later come back in and tell the story of this region. 
which is very important. One, because Stone Age civilizations, that is, Stone Age in terms of the technology that they use, not Stone Age as a value judgment in terms of how sophisticated they are, because they were incredibly sophisticated. It's just that they used tools that are referred to as Stone Age tools because they never got into advanced metallurgy. But in, in cultures like that, it's often quite difficult to identify what happened because in a lot of cases, it doesn't make sense to keep complex notes or day-to-day -day notes using the technology that they have available. Or if they do develop some type of technology that allows them to record such things, then it tends to deteriorate over time. Like a lot of the counting systems in this area, including of the Maya, that involved tying different types of knots onto different types of string and rope to keep track of such things. These are not things that last a super long time, and particularly without translation, it's difficult to understand what they actually mean. And so having these dates literally carved into the objects that we're trying to identify the time period for, that's incredibly helpful. And the other reason that this is so important and so helpful is that the Maya suffered two major cataclysms. And the thing is, from what we understand, these cataclysms were not single events. It wasn't like a meteor hit and suddenly they die off like the dinosaurs. And it wasn't like UFOs arrive and they're all abducted, no matter what some websites on the topic will have you believe. That is probably not what happened. What seems to have happened, based on the data that we have available and the different digs that we've done over the years, is that during the 9th century, what we often refer to as the Classic Maya period ended. And this ending was marked by the collapse of the urban centers. So these cities that had 50 to 120,000 people, some of them at their height may have had upwards of 200,000 people. These cities, over a period of one generation, it's thought, were totally vacated. People just started leaving. And a lot of their population seems to have moved north. This is supported by the subsequent founding of cities in the northern parts of their territory and a lot of the migration myths that exist in the cultures that still remain in that northern area that seem to indicate that at some point they all just picked up and, and left because of some great cataclysm. What is thought to have happened is a, a combination of issues that kind of hit around the same time. And this includes a drought, which we have some records of that show that there was probably a substantial drought in the area around that time. But there was also thought to have been an immense amount of internal warfare between political factions that were opting for control of these cities, which offered a great amount of power over the entire region and the immense amount of trade that took place there between the Maya and the other civilizations in the area, including to their north, the Aztecs. But the final part of this triangle of things that hit all at once is the one that is often focused on, if, if you're not focusing on the alien conspiracy theories. The one that you probably heard about is the environmental degradation that was the result of overpopulation. Essentially, these were great big cities that existed in a time of fairly sophisticated infrastructure for the time period. But these people were living in very small patches of land relative to the size of their population. And that was because there were areas that could sustain human life in this region, but they were few and far between. And you really had to be careful with where you settled because if you settled in the wrong spot, a source of water that seemed solid might turn out to have just been a seasonal thing or turn out to have been something that is there every 10 years, but then gone 10 years after that. And so as a consequence of these three issues that arose seemingly simultaneously or around the same time, a great deal of the population of the entire Mayan culture, but particularly the cities, moved north. Now, in what's referred to as the Mayan post-classic period, 
and these titles are fairly arbitrary and applied by people who research such things after the fact, so these are not periods that people living in the time would very likely have recognized. But during this period, new cities were built. All of them were more easily defensible, which references the fact that there was probably a great deal of infighting, perhaps outfighting as well, because the Aztecs were always there up to their north and they were arguably a bigger and fiercer civilization. But a lot of people who are very studied on this subject seem to think that the defensibility of these cities is the result of the infighting between different people struggling for power within the Mayan civilization. And they were also next to more permanent bodies of water, which is another indicator that perhaps their former settlements were next to bodies that had dried up, or which had proven to be less than reliable. First contact was made with the Spanish conquistadors in 1511, and the arrival of the first round of several hundred cavalry and infantry and a handful of cannon arrived ten years later. But from about 950 BC until that time, the region experienced similar issues to those that had crippled their former settlements. The dominant cultural and political city, Mayapan, was abandoned in 1448, so about 60, 70 years before the conflict with the Spaniards. And a wave of politically inspired warfare and disease and natural disasters crippled the whole region. When the Spanish did finally arrive in earnest, they found a culture divided. There were still active marketplaces, but unlike the Aztecs to the north, there were no centers of power. The Mayan civilization had become more of a distributed, disseminated culture, and though their culture was still immensely influential throughout the region, and honestly remains so today, they had become in some ways more like the connective tissue that connected the other cultures in the regions and held them together loosely through trade, rather than a powerful entity unto themselves. At their cultural height, it's thought that the Mayan civilization contained a few million people, which isn't a huge amount by modern standards, but consider that the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan for the north likely contained between 200 and 300,000 people and is thought by some to have been the largest city in the world at the time. It was five times the size of Henry VIII's London, and its closest competitors in terms of population would have been Paris, Venice, and Constantinople. Many of the Mayan cities were not far behind that in terms of population, so we're working with pretty substantial numbers here in terms of the time and place that we are talking about. But unfortunately, although the region is fairly immense, and the populations were vast, and the societies were very impressive, the resources were concentrated and not spread out the way that they are in other parts of the world, like Europe, for example. And as a result, seemed to be consistent hurdles in the development of the region, and, and perhaps even in the expansion of the cultures living there. Their population allowed them a great amount of prestige and power, but it was also their eventual downfall, in a way, as a result of this, because they had too many people for the amount of resources that they possessed. And that's what I want to talk about today, population, and how a larger population can be seen as both boon and bane, depending on what you're reading, who you're talking to, and which lens through which you are viewing things. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. This episode of Let's Know Things is brought to you by HostGator. Go to hostgator.com slash LKT for Let's Know Things and receive a substantial discount on all of their offerings. This episode is also sponsored by Audible. You can get yourself a free month of Audible plus an audiobook of your choice if you go to audibletrial.com 
slash LKT. Stay tuned till the end of the episode for a book recommendation. All right, let's get back to the show. There are two articles that I want to unspool in this episode. And I want to present two because there are two very different ways, two main different ways to look at the idea of population. And it seems that depending on what you're reading and depending on the point that is being made by the writer of said article or producer of said content, you get a very black or white view and the side that is good and the side that is bad actually changes depending on what you're talking about. When it comes to population, you'll see a lot of articles that are all about how overpopulation is a massive threat to the propagation of human society and and human existence and the continuation of life on the planet even. It's important that we get our consumption under control and it's important to do that, that we limit our population to a certain manageable size or supposedly manageable size. On the other hand, though, particularly when you're looking at economic or political situations, underpopulation is considered to be a great big deal. And so the first article that I have here is from the Washington Post, and the title here is, It's Official, Japan's Population is Dramatically Shrinking. And this article is full of charts and explanations for why this is happening but it is steeped in language that implies that this is an absolutely horrible thing. This is tragic that Japan's population is shrinking and that there doesn't seem to be anything anybody can do about it. Here's a quote that gives an idea of what I mean by this. You can check out that article. Uh, There's a link to it in the show notes for this episode, but here's a quote to give you an idea of what I mean. Quote, So does this come as a surprise to anyone? Nope, not at all. Almost a decade ago, the Washington Post's Fred Hyatt warned that Japan had, quote, embarked on a path no developed nation has ever followed of sustained and inexorable population decline. Double end quote. And so the impression here is that Japan is walking the razor's edge, that they are taking a huge risk by not doing something to bulk up their population. Because although this doesn't mean that their population is just going to dissipate overnight, it's not like it will be cut in half 10 years from now, but having any type of population decline seems to indicate, at least in some people's minds, that Yours is a civilization on decline, not just a population that is numerically on decline. And so that is the lens through which the situation is viewed by that particular article, which again focuses primarily on the economics and political repercussions of a declining population. On the other side of this argument, we've got a post from the notable news site Board Panda. It's, it's a site that tends to do clickbait type articles, but usually of the sort that involve a whole lot of photos and interesting things of that nature. And this article is entitled, and I use article very loosely, it is like a collection of images. The title of it is 17 Powerful Images Showing the Devastating Effects of Overpopulation. So a very different tone than that other article. Or rather, maybe a similar tone, but on opposite sides of the argument. One is bemoaning the decrease in population in a particular region, and the other is bemoaning the increased population on the planet. Now, before I dig into the weeds here in terms of the argument here and the discussion that we're having and why this discussion is so interesting and why it is the way that it is and why it matters, some basic numbers so that we know what we're talking about here, and some basic definitions too, because in a lot of cases we talk past each other when we talk about these types of things. So I think it's important to know what we're talking about. As of March 2016, it is estimated that we have 7.4 billion human beings on the planet. 
the UN estimates that we will have 11.2 billion human beings on the planet by the year 2100. Looking backward, what's really alarming about these numbers is not the numbers themselves, but the increased rate at which we are growing. It's estimated that we reached our first 1 billion people on the planet in the year 1804. And so it took us all of human history on the planet Earth until 1804 to reach 1 billion people in terms of global population. We got our next billion, that is, we reached a population globally of 2 billion by the year 1927, and 3 billion by 1959. So it took all of human history up until 1804 to get 1 billion. And then it took 123 years to get the second billion. And then it took 15 years to get the third billion. From that point forward, every new billion took between 12 and 15 years to generate. That trend is estimated to continue, though some people who are a little bit more pessimistic or optimistic, depending on whether you think a larger population is better or worse, tend to think that continuing to estimate based on those numbers is a very flawed method of estimating global population moving forward, and that very likely we will either begin to shrink or we will continue to expand at an ever-increasing clip until people start to die off due to a number of different things like lack of resources and warfare. When we estimate these numbers, when we count these numbers, it's done in several different ways. Typically, the three main resources for this type of data are the United Nations, the CIA, and the World Bank. And so some people are a bit skeptical of these organizations to begin with, but they do tend to have the best global data of this sort, regardless of what you might think of their politics or trustworthiness in other regards. When we talk about birth rate, what that means is the births per 1,000 people in a population in a given year. And we calculate this in many different ways. We do it through census data. We do it using various estimation techniques. And then that data, the birth rate per 1,000 people in a given year, is combined with the death and migration rates to calculate population growth or loss in a particular region. And a fun but probably not terribly useful fact is that in 2014, there were 4.3 births per second on the planet. And so I bring that up because a lot of the data that we have about these types of things are that type of like factoid data, where it's interesting and allows us to write a tidbit in the newspaper or to reference it during a conversation at a cocktail party, but it doesn't actually tell us anything about the scope of what we're dealing with or how we arrived at these numbers. Hence, digging into that a little bit here before we get into the main conversation. Now, the total fertility rate in a region is measured by looking at the average number of children that a woman would have over the course of her lifetime if she were to survive, first of all, until the end of her fertility period, and if she were to experience the exact average fertility rate for the region in which she is living and the time period in which she is living. And so when you look at something like the fertility rate, that number requires a great number of presuppositions, but it's also something that is incredibly subjective if you think about it, because there are so many different variables that go into fertility and that go into survivability. And in some parts of the world, it's not guaranteed or even necessarily likely during some time periods that a given average woman will survive to the end of her fertile period. And so there's a lot that goes into these numbers. And so the general fertility rate can vary greatly and can also be somewhat useless to an individual if you're looking at that to try to determine how fertile is the right amount of fertile. 
But as a bigger picture data point, it is somewhat useful when we're trying to build these maps of what's growing and what's not growing population-wise and society-wide. When you have a society like Japan, for example, based on that article, that has a sub-replacement fertility rate, this is something that implies that the next generation is going to have fewer people than the previous generation. So what this means is that fertility rate is not high enough to compete with the rate of death and the rate of migration away from the region. So when tallying the population for a region, we have to take the number of people who are leaving that region in one way or another and compare it with the number of people who are being introduced to that region, typically through birth. And so the implication here is that the next generation will be smaller than this current generation, but generations are somewhat arbitrarily measured, almost like the Mayan classic and post-classic periods. These are brackets that are placed around a particular time period, or in the case of generations, around a particular age demographic because it is guessed or estimated that they have similar cultural experiences and as a result can be measured as kind of the same demographic. They have some of the same traits on average. And so there's a lot of issues with that type of measurement as well, in my opinion. When you start saying the baby boomers are this and the Gen Xers are this and the millennials are this, typically it's just a way for us to talk about general cultural trends as opposed to actually saying, yes, everybody who is aged 18 to 24 has these exact specifications and preferences and ideologies. Everybody who is 40 to 50 has this exact collection of biases and prejudices and so on. So when we look at things like fertility rate and sub-replacement fertility rate, in a lot of cases this is what's being measured. So it's not an absolute, this country is going to slowly diminish until there's nothing there. It's typically something like that, where the shape of the population graph is changing, but that is something that could change again depending on how this next generation feels about children and how many of the necessary resources and things like that they have that allow them to have children. Now something that's important to understand about the discussion around population today and the politics around population today is that on average, as a general rule right now, the wealthier countries in the world have lower populations and have populations that are not growing as fast as they once did. Whereas the Countries in the world where there are economic issues or where they have political crises or where they have war, things of that nature, the birth rate is going up. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of these children will survive, but it does mean you have a situation in which the countries with the highest birth rate tend to also be the countries where the economy is not flourishing where people tend to be poorer and the economies tend to be less sophisticated. That's not a value judgment, but less sophisticated in terms of they tend to produce raw materials rather than finished goods, things of that nature. And they also tend to be less connected internationally. So they might be very isolated nations or nations that don't have as many trade partnerships and things like that on the books. There are a lot of different reasons from this, stemming from cultural tradition or religious tradition. In some cases, you know, you're encouraged to have a bunch of children by your religion or by society. Sometimes you need the children to help work on the farm or otherwise take care of the family. Sometimes you have more children because it's supposed, it's, it's guessed that at least some of the children that you have will die in infancy. And in a lot of these places, too, the idea of birth control or, or the reality of birth control are not as accessible or accepted in some cases, again, because of religion or because of tradition, and in other cases, because women do not have as much control over their health or reproductive health or, or necessarily even place in society 
and in those types of cultures, there tends to be a higher birth rate as well. When we use the word overpopulation, this can refer to humans or, or any other type of population, by the way, animals or, or even plants. It's when a population of any living thing exceeds the carrying capacity of their ecological niche. And so, you know, you can have a massive population if you also have an immense amount of resources, but if you have a massive population and few resources, you are screwed. And so this can be balanced out by having fewer of this particular animal or life form, or you can have more resources, or you can have, for example, cows that are grazing in a particular area. If each cow has less food, then they won't overgraze as quickly. You can also create more overall output so that each resource goes further. When it comes to human overpopulation in particular, we tend not to just discuss the, the number of people very often. Usually the conversation goes much further than that. What we're really talking about is overconsumption or overutilization of non-renewable resources or the consequences of things like urbanization, the increased spread of disease, the increased clash of cultures, the secondary consequences of some of these things like the Increased consumption of resources and the subsequent lack of resources in some regions can lead to increased warfare and conflict, in addition to the direct consequences of having fewer resources. And so typically when we say overpopulation, and we're talking about humans, that's what we're talking about. We're not just talking about having a bunch of people and the relative value or non-value into having a greater number of human beings on the planet. What we're talking about is the consequences of more mouths to feed, more homes necessary, more electricity that needs to be generated, and things of that nature. We also tend to think about human population in terms of a timeline rather than just saying what's happening now. I can tell you the population today, but that for most people who are having this conversation is less relevant than the population 10 years from now, and to a certain degree less relevant than the population 10 years ago, because these numbers help us determine where this trend is going, at least ostensibly. Hopefully it helps us have some predictive power about this, because in terms of how we organize and in terms of how we produce and in terms of how we consume and how we save and all of these investments that we're making monetarily and in terms of other resources, but also in terms of our infrastructure and how society operates, they're kind of predicated on knowing what the world will look like to a certain degree in 10 years or 100 years. And if we don't, if we massively undervalue or overvalue that number, then we'll be in a lot of trouble. If we have too many people, then our non-renewable resource situation will be an issue and where people actually live might be an issue because it is very cheek to jowl already in a lot of countries around the world because resources are aggregated in very specific places. But then it's also an issue if we overestimate and find ourselves with far fewer people than we thought we would have, then we might be in a situation where well, our economy is dependent on having a certain number of people involved. And if there's not enough people working and not enough people consuming, then the entire thing kind of falls apart. As an attempt to try to mitigate some of these consequences, these negative consequences that could occur if we do not estimate correctly, some countries, some populations, some governments have instigated human population planning protocols. One example of this is China's one-child policy, which has been loosened to a certain degree, but this is something that, as much as anything else, has really helped define what the population of China looks like. Essentially, between 1978 and 1980, they phased this policy in, and it basically said, you can only have one child per family. Because they realized that their population was booming to such an extreme degree 
that if they did not instigate such a policy, they would very likely have several hundred million more people than they could handle, than they could feed, and that they could clothe, and that they could house as a nation. And looking at it from this point in time, a few years after they began to officially phase the rule out, it's difficult to say what the actual impact was, because birth rates in the region decreased during that time period. And it's thought that the same would have applied to China regardless. And so the, the official government statement is that they prevented around 400 million people from being born. That is a number that a lot of scholars disagree with. But regardless of what the actual impact was, the attempt itself was an example of human population planning. And this is actually kind of a non-standard approach to this type of planning. Most typically, human population planning is not coercive. It's not compulsory. It usually takes the form of more education, particularly about health and healthcare and family planning, and increased access to things like contraception. These types of resources provided to people in a non compulsory way will typically reduce birth rates as well. That said, not all human population planning efforts are attempts to keep the population down. In some cases, after a war or a famine, there will be efforts to increase the population. There was actually an effort in Iran when they were basically under constant threat from Saddam Hussein over in Iraq, and they were losing young men like crazy. The leader of the country basically said, hey, women, if you're going to be patriotic, do your duty. Have some more kids. We need to build an army. And the way you build an army is by having a bunch of kids and then waiting for a little bit. And so they did. And then the conflicts subsided and they found themselves looking down the barrel of this time bomb. Because after another decade, they would have a country full of young men that they couldn't do well by, that they wouldn't have enough jobs for. And so they would have a real problem where there's a bunch of young men wandering about with no money, no future, nothing to do. And that causes a lot of problems above and beyond simply having too many mouths to feed. And so you might instigate human population planning to go one way or the other, or in some cases you might go one way and then decide that you need to go the other way because you pushed too far. These are typically very imperfect types of programs, even with the best intentions. Population control, on the other hand, is more typically coercive. It involves the controlled breeding and, in some cases, the culling, the killing of whatever species it is that you're trying to control the population of. And thankfully, we most often hear this term when referring to animals, but it has occurred in human populations as well. And some of the most horrible moments in human history have been the consequence or the act of human population control. You could also look at things like eugenics programs, which for a long while were popular all over the world. They, they happened definitely in Nazi Germany for reasons that are probably understandable because they were trying to build a master race, but even here in the United States, we had fairly expansive eugenics programs for a while, where we, in a lot of cases, neutered, essentially, undesirables, quote-unquote undesirables, like poor people or certain races or certain religions, different ethnic makeups. This is something that took place all around the world. And so that is an example of population control, not to be confused with population planning. Population planning is usually giving out birth control and educating people about family planning and health. It also includes things like China's one-child policy, whereas population control is actually going in and killing people and preventing them from having children forcibly. So those are the broad strokes about this conversation about population. And again, it's a very common storyline that you'll see all over the place, that we are overpopulated and that we're using too many resources and that it's not sustainable and we're creating too much pollution. But look somewhere else, potentially in the same newspaper or on the same website, and you'll also see panic when our population doesn't reach its replacement rate. 
That is, we do not have enough new children being born to replace those who are dying off or migrating elsewhere. And so these two ideas seem to be in conflict, and they both do get tied up in other issues as well. They get tied up in the struggle about animal rights and environmental use and abuse and global climate change and poverty and superbugs and war and economic collapse and the argument over capitalism and in particular the global capitalistic system, pseudo-capitalistic system if you want to call it that, that we are building. So we've got a lot of different ideologies at play here and a lot of different potential routes, potential angles from which to look at this, and potential means of discussing it, but also a lot of potential means of derailing a discussion. And that's unfortunate because the issues here are really big and really important. One of the prime ideologies that takes center stage when we're discussing the decrease in population in particular and why it's harmful is the ideology around our economy. That is, that we need to maintain constant growth. And if we do not maintain constant uh, economic growth, that is, then we're in big trouble because that means that our economies are winding down and losing steam, and we are about to be Rome, collapsed by outside forces that are younger and more nimble and more open to evolution. And anything that ceases to grow and to infinitely scale is something that we need to let collapse. In order to continue to scale in that way, infinitely, we also need to grow population-wise infinitely. Because otherwise we will not have enough people to work, we will not have enough mouths to feed, we will not have enough people to buy the different things, the different widgets that we produce. And so there's that angle of that argument, that population decline is a negative thing. There's also something kind of latent and biological that comes out very often, that life is wonderful and therefore more life must be even more wonderful. Life is sacred in some cases is the way that it's said. Or some religions, as I mentioned before, do encourage the massive propagation of the species. You need to have more kids all the time. That will create more of our type, of our particular religion, but it's generally pitched as, you know, more life is better, more kids are better, how could that possibly be wrong? Things like birth control and abortion and contraception of any kind is not good. In some cases, this even goes so far as women working or women being educated is also bad because that tends to decrease the birth rates as well. So the question that I always have when I read something like that, something that seems to presuppose that a decrease in population is bad, is would it be? Would would that actually be so horrible to have a decrease in population? Isn't it possible that a lot of the problems that we have today are the consequence of the systems that we have today? And so isn't it possible that we need to change those systems and the way that they operate and the very shape of them if we're going to solve those problems? It's really nice to think about keeping things consistent and unchanged because that is a secure thought. Nobody wants to be alive or few people want to be alive during the massive shattering of society that can happen when everything changes. But isn't that something that we have to consider? if we do have all of these problems that seem to be unsolvable from within the system that created them. Don't we require change to make change? But anytime I think that, I very quickly run against the wall of how that would work. Like, it's one thing to say we need to decrease the the global population, but like, how do you decrease the global population. Not only is the scale and scope of that massive, and not only are there hundreds of competing factions, and that's if we're being reductive, that all have different rules and regulations and way of approaching things and ideologies. So how do you scale down something like this when our entire mechanism for everything is consumption and growth? At a certain point, you can't help but think, well, we would have to start 
culling people. We would have to start killing off the old or the diseased, or we would maybe have to spread a disease around the world so the people who can't handle it, the biologically weaker people would die off. Would we impose like an age limit so you reach 70 years old and then you have to go off on the ice flow? Or maybe reproduction limits? That, to me, seems like it would be the most likely thing to work and to be accepted. But even that, with certain societies, it just it seems incredibly unlikely. And I, I could see a situation where, almost like with the Global Climate Change Accords, where because certain groups refuse to take part or don't take part as much as everybody else, then those who do take part almost feel like they are being played because they are suffering through what's kind of an economic disadvantage, at least in the near term, whereas everybody else isn't, so they are getting an economic advantage. And the same could be true, or at least seen to be true with this, where a great number, even if it's like half of the countries in the world, decide that we're only going to allow one child per family for a period of time. Those other countries that do not do that could be seen to have a certain type of advantage, even if it's just in raw numbers of people that they could then potentially turn into soldiers or infrastructure for soldiers. I could see how that would be kind of a game changer or perceived to be a game changer and could kill the entire idea before it has a chance to actually take place. Now, I, I mentioned before that Iran had that issue where they, they attempted some population control by encouraging women to have more children, encouraging families to have more children to help repopulate for a war effort against Iraq. And then they realized that they would have too many kids in like a decade, and that would be a real social problem. And so what they did is population control in reverse. They implemented a series of family planning efforts, and they, they started educating women about family planning and about reproductive health. They didn't make birth control compulsory, and they, they didn't make it compulsory to only have a certain number of children, but they did make classes on the subject of family planning compulsory. And so suddenly everybody, all the women in the country, were very educated on how children are made and how a healthy child is reared up and what it takes to have a child and what that involves biologically and socially and physically. And they made available the resources to act on that knowledge. They made available birth control and health screenings and classes and things of that nature. And as a result, it had the same effect that reducing the number of children that people are allowed to have would have had. It also resulted in a more educated populace, in particular the women who up until that point did not have as much education about that type of thing because it was considered to be socially inappropriate. Now, we could do something like that on a large scale. The birth rate already goes down in cultures that have better health care and access to health care, those who are more educated. And so increasing those things, it stands to reason, all around the world and making that the thing that we try to tackle could be a really positive way to try to deal with this. In particular, because worst case scenario, it doesn't work as we think it will work in all of these different places in terms of population control. At the very least, we've gone out and improved quality of life for everybody on the planet. And that by itself is a, it's a nice <laughs> secondary impact for this type of effort. That said, I mean, there are alternatives to reducing population or trying to scale population to something that, according to our current ideas on the subject, seem to be manageable or sustainable. We could conceivably keep growing. I mean, we do, as humans, biologically seem to have a predisposition to want to reproduce, which is something that most life that we know of tends to want to do. So we want to pass on our DNA, but we also, as humans, tend to want to know what's over the next horizon. We tend to want to explore and find things. And so we could continue to expand. We could move onto the ocean floor and build cities on top of the water and burrow underground and build underground cities and sky cities. And we could go into space and colonize other planets and asteroids and build space stations. 
there are a lot of options in that direction. I would argue that most of them actually do make a whole lot more sense when combined with either population management or rather than reducing the population, finding a sustainable population rate and holding to it until we generate more resources or colonize another planet or build another underwater city, at which point then we can have a little bit more and then a little bit more and so on. Because unfortunately, even if we do suppose that we go into full-scale expansion mode and decide to utilize every spare plot of land and water and space and sky, that is something that requires infinite expansion. And although we are wired for that, it's something that traditionally leads to a lot of bad consequences. One example of that happening in our history is Japan actually invaded Manchuria initially, which is the conflict that led to several things which eventually led to their involvement in World War II. They invaded because they were running out of space and food. They were running out of resources because of a population boom. So because they expanded, they needed to go take somebody else's stuff because there was no other way to get it. And that led to a lot of negative things, which then eventually led to them being where they are today, where they know they have a finite amount of resources, including land. And so their population is decreasing. And though that's not ideal politically and potentially economically, it's also something that is kind of okay if they are not at a point where they can comfortably sustain themselves resource-wise right now. That doesn't necessarily mean that all expansionistic efforts will result in our having to take from somebody else or eventually reaching the point where we've expanded too much and we have to contract to counterbalance that. But we do have numerous examples of that happening throughout history where our expansionistic tendencies are then countered by kind of an equal and opposite force in the other direction. And so that's worth considering whether or not expansion is a truly sustainable thing or just something that is really nice to think about because it wouldn't require us to make so many difficult decisions. And so then you can't help but think about what it would be to get smaller and, and what that would actually look like. We've always, all of us alive listening to this today, I don't know, maybe if this show continues into the distant future, that won't be the case, but everybody living today in the year 2016 has lived in a world where we've been growing like crazy in terms of population. There's been an immense population boom in our lifetimes. So trying to imagine what it might look like to have a world where the population is shrinking is actually kind of hard to imagine. It's something that would require us to look at each new generation as smaller than our own generation. And so rather than building a continuous stream of new, bigger, more expansive infrastructure for them, more homes, more businesses, more everything, more roads, we might not need to do that. We'll, we'll have plenty. In fact, we'll have empty homes once our generation dies off and the next generation moves in. And so it really changes the math on everything that we do, from food production to real estate building to our resource grid, the electricity and internet and stuff that we funnel out to everybody. This option is something that probably wouldn't have even been worth considering pre, I don't know, World War II, maybe World War I, but, but in particular World War II, because from that point forward, we had so much more automation than we did beforehand that it's actually possible for us to continue to have the same quality of life and standard of living and amount of wealth, even material wealth, with fewer and fewer people who are working in the factories and the workshops and the stores. Because each person is able to produce more value with smart use of automation, it doesn't mean that our entire economic system would collapse necessarily if we had fewer people participating in it. In fact, it could mean 
that more people would be responsible for consuming more or consuming different things that have more value because we might be able to maintain the same amount of production but have fewer people participating in that economy. And that's something that could even amplify further and further. If we did decide to go full-on automation, which seems to be the direction that we're going, it may be that even with a reduced population, more and more people don't actually have to work. And so we'll have to come up with a system that will allow us to propagate what we've got in terms of being able to produce things well and consistently and evolve our technology without necessarily depending on that consumption-fed mechanism that we've got right now. Now, it's, it's nice to talk about and think about this. I do talk about this type of thing a lot, the restructuring of the economy and the potential for a smaller, more focused economy, more automation, less growth for growth's sake, and more effort applied where it will actually do good. But it, it does leave out the dramatic societal shifts that would occur as a result, and that would be a difficult thing for a lot of people to stomach. That said, we have massive societal shifts all the time in human history, and, and even today, it's just that we tend to put them in place. We tend to instigate these changes after a disaster happens or after a collapse of some type of infrastructure. It might make sense then, since we do have all of this data and it is something that we, we believe at least that we can foresee, to start making some of these changes before the collapse so that we don't have to do so much rebuilding. We can actually build things better intentionally rather than doing it out of panic and fear. It's very likely that if we start building sooner rather than later, that we could actually build an economy that is more robust, but it uses fewer raw materials. There, there's a lot of different ways to create value and to create productive power, I guess is a good way to put it. If you think of a smartphone and everything that it does and the power that it puts into a person's hand, it still does require some exotic elements to make such a thing and a, a global infrastructure to create such a thing cheaply. But at the same time, I don't need to own so many devices now. I don't need to depend on so many different gadgets and possessions when I have something like a smartphone that is this capable. And so if we continue to build things that are more and more capable and more and more resilient and rugged and perhaps even things that we can upgrade really well that tend to last a lot longer or are recyclable in some way, I could absolutely see us creating a situation where just as our population is shrinking, so are the amount of materials that we need to consume in order to produce a massive amount of value and to continue to allow people to have the amount of access and infrastructure and power and entertainment, frankly, that they have today using fewer resources and fewer laborers. Unfortunately, a, a lot of the imaginary versions of a futuristic society in which we have been overpopulated, they are not terribly generous to us in this regard. You look at Soylent Green or Logan's Run or Children of Men, even the Expanse series, which is a, a wonderful book series and is now a TV series, they tend to show the impact of overpopulation on Earth and elsewhere in a really dystopian manner. These are situations where we clearly did not plan very well, or we started planning and instigating too late because we were forced to implement a lot of these quote-unquote solutions after the disaster, after we started to run out of resources, after the climate changed completely and would no longer sustain us, or the wars got out of control, the wars over diminishing resources, or we didn't develop the right technologies in time. You know, we, we have non-renewable resources that we used until they ran out rather than using those as stepping stones to renewable resources. Look around at pop culture today, at movies and books and plays and comic books and even music, and you will see references to this all the time. Because it is a major cultural concern that none of us feels that we can address individually. And as a result, we're kind of preparing ourselves for the worst psychologically. 
hopefully that preparation doesn't become necessary because other preparations will go into place instead. Alan Wiseman, the author of the book Countdown, says that if each woman on the planet had 0.5 fewer children, on average, half a child less than they have today, we would be able to reduce back down to a holding population on planet Earth of 6 billion people, rather than headed towards 11 billion by the end of the century like we are today. I'm always wary of these types of statistics in the same way that I'm wary of the if everyone lived like people in the United States, we would need X number of planets type statistics because they're all very different. They all measure very different things. In a lot of cases, they're trying to make a point and they sacrifice accuracy in order to make a point. But they're, they're all very flawed. And typically, we don't even know in which direction they are flawed. We just know that they are all very different and draw their information from different places. These are stats that are good to grab attention. And good numbers are required on this topic. I don't think that we have the numbers that we need yet, but we will need good numbers. But the, the bigger concept is what matters. And that is that we've got a problem. A series of problems, really, but they tie back to the central problem of finite resources. And we're going to have to address it one way or the other. So either we focus now hard on expanding further out and down and up into space, and we put into place the renewable resources that we will need to sustain that type of immense population. And we'll have to invest like crazy on where we're going, not where we are because we won't be able to be here much longer. And so that will require a dramatic shift in the way the economy works and politics works and everything else. And that's the continued growth model. It requires change too. Or we focus on reducing the population. And we can still expand and hopefully still will, but we reach a balance point that we can sustain. And that's more likely to happen if we expand and contract at the same time if we expand our resources and the amount that we get out of them and the amount of land that we have available by going off planet and by ensuring that we can build ocean cities and things like that while also reducing the population. The nice thing to me about this solution, and, and there's positives about both of these directions, I would argue, but what, what's nice to me about this one is that it makes the world better, more egalitarian, while also reducing the population. It's kind of like that argument against climate change denialism. There, there's people who argue that we needn't invest our time and energy in trying to reduce pollution and trying to change the way that we do things. Because what if climate change isn't really happening? What if we're reading the data wrong or it's all a government conspiracy or whatever? And then we put all this time and effort and resources into it, and it turns out not to be true. And the, the argument against that, the response to that, of course, is then, oh no, we, we would be wasting all this money building a sustainable energy infrastructure and cleaning up the air and environment and buffering ourselves against other impending disasters that are indelible parts of working with finite resources. Oh no, it's a good solution even if it doesn't work exactly the way that we think it will on the problems that we don't know exactly how to solve yet. It will still work on the problems that we do know how to solve. And that, to me, is as good an argument as any for at least starting to invest in that direction as much as possible, even if we decide to pivot in another direction at some point. And so how do we make these changes once we decide which direction to go, which direction we as individuals actually support? Unfortunately, most of the changes that are required will need to be implemented by governments or similar institutions. And this puts a very fine point in my mind how important it is that we figure out ways to sway government decisions as much as possible. As individuals and as small groups of like-minded people, this means getting out to vote. Whether or not you actually think that your vote counts, statistically, your demographics needs will become more relevant to politicians, the more of you who get out there and vote. And so even if statistically your vote doesn't matter in how it's tallied, 
you getting out to vote and getting other people like you out to vote actually does slowly but surely sway the political process. It also might mean working on your local elections. I've always thought that the smartest thing that groups like Occupy Wall Street could have done after their, their protests was to go and occupy the lower level of every local government that they could, to go and run for township treasurer of the smallest towns in the entire country, and to do this across the entire country, and then to slowly work their way up the ranks. It is true that very often the best way to change a system or to influence a system is from the inside, and particularly a system like ours here in the U.S. and across a good portion of the planet, which tend to be bulwarked against outside interference of any major kind at least. It's best to try to get inside and change it, and so doing whatever you can to, to do that from the inside could make a whole lot of difference as well. But you can also, if you find yourself in a position of influence, use it to try to sway public opinion in this direction. And that might mean using your social media following to encourage people to read up on the subject or creating a piece of art, be it a play or a movie or a book or a painting or something that gets people thinking about it. These are things that do sway public opinion in, in more ways than we tend to, to think they do. And so getting these ideas in front of people and making it clear that this is something that we need to be not just thinking about, but acting on and investing in now, that is a very good use of whatever influence you might find yourself with. And what's nice is that in supporting that move toward population stability rather than infinite growth in particular, all you really have to do in order to move in that direction is to promote certain other ideas like increased education and health and human rights, particularly for women. And if you do that, and if you do that everywhere, then that is the type of thing that will help us get where we want to be without even having to have the conversation about population and without necessarily having to overhaul everything right away. We will no matter what, likely end up overhauling everything in fits and starts over a period of generations, but we don't have to get Congress to commit to a science fiction sounding plan to move in the right direction. We just have to promote certain humanistic ideals. Now the question is, will we do that on the necessary scale? There are a lot of incredibly unimportant conversations that are happening that are overwhelming this type of conversation. And so I, I don't know, even if we do really put our backs into it and try to get people discussing this and making decisions on it and acting on it, who's to say whether or not it will even show up as a blip on the radar of most people and whether or not we can do it before we cross given lines in the sand and, and these lines that we don't even know where they are, these points of no return, will we achieve it before those? It's hard to say. I certainly hope so, because the cost of not getting this sorted out and not starting to move in one direction or the other is, frankly, too massive to comprehend. This episode of Let's Know Things was brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is the hosting company that I have very happily used for many years. I have used a handful of different hosting companies over the years, but for numerous different reasons, I really didn't enjoy working with them and eventually switched over all of my online properties to HostGator. And I did that because they're just very pleasant to work with, have great customer service, have great prices, and it's very easy to manage all of my stuff. So whether you are keen to start a blog or a portfolio site or a website for your business, they are a wonderful option that I highly recommend. If you go to hostgator.com LKT, they are offering substantial discounts, something like 35 to 60%, I think, off their normal prices to listeners of Let's Know Things. So that is an excellent way to get started on that project of yours while also helping out the show. Let's Know Things is also sponsored by Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com LKT, 
you can get a free month of their service and a free audiobook. And so if you want to see what all they have to offer, you can get a free month of Audible plus a free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash LKT. And if you are looking for a book to spend that credit on, might I suggest the book Collapse by Jared Diamond. And the, the subtitle is How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed. Now, Jared Diamond is perhaps most famous for his book Guns, Germs, and Steel. If you liked that one or think you might, Collapse is a good book for you to check out. It was written well after Guns, Germs, and Steel. It was written in 2005, and it essentially focuses on humans and the things that we have consistently done throughout history that have either caused us to succeed or to fail, to expand or contract, to evolve or to stagnate. And so it's, it's a very good book for this particular episode because he does actually talk about overpopulation. And so he goes through these different influences and these different tendencies and tells a lot of stories that put these ideas into historical context. It's not an easy breezy read, but it is quite deep and quite good. Like all of his books, it is an excellent look at this subject and gives you a whole lot to go on when thinking about this topic as well. He just he, It's a real, real deep dive into the idea of what makes societies succeed or fail and why it keeps happening over the course of human history and human contemporary society as well. So if you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you can snag that for free. I've had a lot of people asking how they can get these books and still benefit the show, even if they already have Audible or, or don't want to use audiobooks for some reason. And you can if you go to letsknowthings.com. You will find, if you scroll down a little bit, a bunch of different options in terms of how to support the show. And there is a link there that if you click it, it will take you to Amazon and I will get a refer fee for that. So thank you for asking. I appreciate that. And I appreciate all the support you guys offer for the show, very much including checking out the sponsors. And so other ways that you can support the show, if you'd like to, you can go to letsknowthings.com, click on that Amazon link and do your shopping there. You can also contribute directly through PayPal or Venmo, cash.me. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. You can pay a dollar an episode or more if you like, but a dollar an episode would be amazing at letsknowthings.com. Also very much appreciated is sharing the show with a friend or with your social network. That is how new people discover it most typically, and so that is very, very helpful to the continuation and propagation and expansion, hopefully sustainably, of this show. Also helpful are the stars and reviews that you leave on iTunes. Thank you so much for everybody who's done that already. If you have not yet, I would really appreciate it if you have a spare second, because that also helps bring new people in. Also on letsknowthings.com, you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode. You can also sign up for the Let's Know Things newsletter, which comes out every Monday and contains a selection of curated links to interesting things. You can find Let's Know Things on Facebook and on Instagram at Let's Know Things. You can find out more about me and my work, including my books, at colin.io. My blog is at exilelifestyle.com, and my YouTube show, Consider This, can be found at considerthis.io. Thank you so much for listening. As always, I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.